So in this video, I want to discuss a little bit about culture and its impact on communication and how it affects communication. So first of all, let's take a look at what culture is, what we mean when we say culture. Well, culture is, first of all, learned and shared. It's not something you're born with or, or something that's just automatically ingrained in you. Culture is something that you learn from those who come before you and something you share with those around you and those who come after you. So culture is learned and shared. First, it's also uh, culture is made up of these symbols, language, values, and norms. That's Those are the four components of culture, four things that go into making a culture, symbols, language, values, and norms. We'll talk about each of those here in just a moment in greater detail. Culture is also how we distinguish one group of people from another. And that could be, you know, we talk about culture like in large scale means like countries and things like that, but, but uh, you can also define culture and, and see culture if you walk into any high school cafeteria. You'd be able to tell groups, the jocks over here and the, the band geeks over here and the whatever, the nerds over there, however you, uh, culture is defined these days in, in high schools and middle schools and things. But uh, so culture exists all over the place. It's not just different countries, but culture exists within any community, any, any where you have groups of people that are distinguishable from one another. You're going to have culture. We talk about culture in terms of in-groups, which is what we define as us. Anytime we would use the expression us to talk about something, that's what we call an in-group. And anytime we would say them, that's what we call an out-group. So we have in-groups and out-groups that make up cultures. And so um, that's a, an, another basic characteristic of culture. Culture also has to do with ethnocentrism. We want to avoid ethnocentrism when, when we're engaging in talk about culture. We, won't, we don't want to mix the two up, but we also want to be careful not to step over into ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is this, is this idea that your culture, whatever that culture is, is greater than other cultures or, or in, in some ways superior to other cultures. So if we were to take an ethnocentric view of the United States, uh, the map, according to the Americans, uh, an ethnocentric view of, of the world for ethnocentric Americans, would look something like this, where America is the center of the universe and everywhere else is just defined by, you know, things like coffee comes from here or zoo animals come from here and so forth. And so um, it would be a very limited, very ethnocentric view of the world. So, but believe it or not, this is a map that we all grew up with, or a lot of us grew up with, and it's actually sort of ethnocentric in and of itself. It was developed by European people and, and people who valued Europe and the United States, and it may surprise you to know that this map is not really proportionally accurate. It doesn't really lay the world out in the appropriate way, not only because it's flat, but because uh, the proportions of the countries the sizes of the countries to one another are not accurate. And this may surprise you. So I want you to, to freeze this in your mind, this this map of the world um, and the size of things here. And I'm going to show you this next slide is actually a map of uh, correct proportions of the world, believe it or not. So uh, other portions of the world, Africa is much bigger than you may have thought it was. South America, Brazil is much bigger than you thought it was probably. Uh, and, and Europe is probably much smaller than you've always thought it was because um, they're not represented accurately on the different maps. The initial one I showed you is called the Mercator projection map. This is called the Peters projection map. So let's take a look at them side by side, just to show you the difference. So on the left you have the Peters, which is proportionately accurate, and on the right you have the Mercator map, which is not proportionally accurate, which, which is the one we grew up with, which again is really goes to show ethnocentrism at its heart, uh, because that Mercator projection map was developed um, really by Europeans to uh, and, and really kind of enhances the importance size-wise of, of Europe in a, in a disproportionate way and in the United States and North America really so and it kind of minimalizes South America and, and Africa and different places like that so um, anyway uh, if you really want your mind to be blown there there are people there's what's called the cartographers for social justice which are map makers for social justice that believe that even the Peters projection map in and of itself doesn't go far enough to promote social justice because it still puts people on the bottom part of the map and nobody wants to be on the bottom, right? So they say that the world, the map should look something like this, that we should flip it upside down. Does that blow your mind? Is that something different for you to see? Um, so I'll give you a second to take that in. But anyway, just the idea of ethnocentrism, and we want to avoid uh, that type of thing in, in our view of culture. Culture, it's also important to indicate, is not ethnicity, race, or nationality. That's not what we're talking about. Again, culture is learned and shared. Your ethnicity, your race, and your nationality are not learned and shared. 
uh, culture it is not equate to ethnicity, race, or nationality. Sometimes it will follow those things, but it's not the same thing when we're defining it. So um, that, those, that's something that culture is not. So again, as I mentioned, culture is made up of these four components, symbols, language, values, and norms. Um, so uh, I want to take a look at the components of U.S. culture so we can kind of get an indication of what we mean by those types of things. So we're going to take a look at each of these components, uh, symbols, language, values, and norms, as they relate to United States culture so we can get a better understanding. So when we think about symbols, uh, things that symbolize the United States, but symbols for the United States would be like this, right? Those are symbols in the United States. No, just a little joke. Those, that's the wrong spelling of symbols. Symbols in the United States would be things like the flag, right? The American flag is a symbol of the United States worldwide. Wherever you go, you're going to see that and know that that represents the United States. Things like the bald eagle, right? Our national bird. Um, the majestic bald eagle is a symbol of the United States. The Statue of Liberty is a symbol of the United States. Uh, apple pie and baseball are symbols of the United States, right? They're things that represent the idea and, and the values of the United States, things that represent us, that, that we look at these and we automatically can see kind of the ideals that are, that are manifested when we think about U.S. culture. The language that uh, that represents our culture, uh, it's not a legal thing, but, but really English is the most prominent language spoken in the United States and kind of the unofficial, lang unofficial official language. We don't have an official language in the United States, but uh, the English is kind of the, the common language that we have here in the United States. So we do have that shared language. We also have, I'm sorry, shared values, some values that we share uh, here for the United States, including things like liberty and things like justice. That's Lady Justice, if you don't know. Uh, things like equality that we that we at least espouse to represent in, in the United States. We try to, uh, honesty is uh, claimed to be important in the United States. And what are some of the norms that we have here in the United States, some things that represent norms for us? So some of the norms we have here in the United States are these two guys, right? No, just jokes. If you're too young to understand this, then I apologize. On the left, you have Norm from Cheers. On the right, you have Norm MacDonald, both classic uh, comedy characters in the, United, in the United States here. But anyway, so norms in the United States are, first of all, that we drive on the right side of the road. Not only the correct side of the road, but actually the right side of the road, as opposed to the left side of the road, like they do in, in the U.K. and Australia and different parts of... Uh, the world where they drive on the opposite side of the road. So the norm here is that we drive on the right. The norm here is that we have, you know, the, the mom and dad and 2.5 kids with the puppy and the big lawn and things like that. Um, not the same as everywhere else in the world where you have different sized families and you have different kind of living, uh, living uh, abodes and different things. So the norm here in the United States is that we eat meat. We eat meat. It's a fairly common thing here in the United States. Again, we and not only meat, but we eat the meat of, of cows primarily, right? Beef and pork and different things. And those are norms here in the United States that are not the same in other parts of the world. Uh, the sports that we have here in the United States, again, soccer is like the worldwide phenomenon, right? And it's coming on here in the United States. But really in the U.S., we're basketball, baseball, football, and hockey. Those are the norms here in the United States. And, and, and they differ from norms in the other part of the world. So, and that's true of every culture. You're going to have represented here with symbols, language, values, and norms. In any culture that you're a part of. Uh, again, I have, um, uh, I play darts, for example. And so darts has its own culture. Some of the symbols that you have in darts are, are things like your darts themselves. What kind of darts do you have? What kind of dart case do you have? Um, what kind of t-shirt are you wearing? Does it have darts on it? Those types of things are symbols that represent you as a dart player and your seriousness and your, and your level of expertise as a dart player, whether it actually represents that or not. There's also a language that goes along with darts. Uh, we talk about things like hat tricks and we talk about things like alligator arms and we, you know, a variety of things that, that go along with playing darts that it has its own language, so to speak, even though that language is typical for us, it's typically English. Um, there, there are different terms and phrases that go along with darts that has its own language. There are values. Some some leagues that you play in, some communities that you play in, value high scoring games. Others value games where there's very little scoring and that you're just trying to close things out. And so that there are different ways that the game is played and they value different things. And if you violate that, then you're going to be uh, in trouble with some people. And then there are norms, the way that you behave. What do you say after somebody throws? Do you say good darts? Do you say nice, nice work? Do you say anything at all if they had a bad round? Do you fist bump them? Do you fist bump them every time or only when they have a good round? There are different norms that, that, that exist in these places. Um, when somebody gets a hat trick, are you supposed to buy them a beer or are you not? Um, again, different norms for different places 
um, but dart has darts has its own culture and has its own symbols language values and norms as does every culture so important to recognize that so how does communicate how does culture affect communication well in a variety of ways and we're just going to touch on these briefly but i have things the notion of things like high and low context cultures um, so high context cultures tend to pay very close attention to um, things going on in the background they pay more attention to nonverbal signals they pay attention to what's going on in the other person's life whereas low context cultures we pay less attention to that in the united states is very much a low context culture we're more concerned with um, our own thing, what we have to say. And we pay much more attention to verbal cues and to what's actually being said. Individualism and collectivism um, is going to affect communication as well. Individualistic cultures tend to be more me-oriented, tend to be more uh, impacted by what's, how does this affect me, or what do I need to get out of this, as opposed to collectivistic cultures, which tend to look at the whole more and say what is the what's going to be best for the group, what's going to be best for the community. Um, and there's, again, positives and negatives that go along with all of these things. Individualistic cultures tend to be more uh, creative, tend to be more innovative, whereas collectivistic cultures tend to be more um, able to, to, to produce things on a mass level, for example, and, and more harmony in that regard. So it's not a better or worse type situation. It's just different. Uh, low and high power distance cultures. What's the separation between the classes? What's the separation in terms of formality between um, you know, supervisor and supervisee, um, things like that. So you have uh, differences there around the world. Uh, different cultures accept uh, uncertainty better than others uh, or worse than others. Um, different. Some cultures are okay with ambiguity. Other cultures like the United States, we're not so great at that. We don't want ambiguity. We want facts. We want straightforward. We want not beating around the bush. And other cultures are more uh, apt to um, be more flowery in their rhetoric and be more willing to um, not say no, for example, if it's considered rude to say no, they'll come up with ways to not say no, but still give you the, they still know that they're saying no without them saying no, if that makes any sense, which it might not if you're from the United States, because we don't do that. We just say no, because we don't like uncertainty. Right? Achievement versus nurturing, um, you know, valuing those two things differently in different, in different cultures, and then um, what we call monochronic and polychronic cultures, which really has to do with time and our view of time. The United States is a very monochronic culture, very much time is money. Um, and so, you know, and, and appointments are set at a certain time. And if you're supposed to start a meeting at three o'clock, it starts at three o'clock and it ends at when it's supposed to, as opposed to other cultures which have more of a fluid understanding of time. Or fluid, not, not they don't use the same clock or whatever, but, but you know, a meeting scheduled to start at three, may start at three, may start closer to 3.15, may start a little earlier or later, depending on when people are available. Even if it does start at 3, it may just be a lot of chit-chat until 3.15 or 3.30. Um, just a different way of viewing time and valuing time, um, and as opposed to valuing um, those relationships and developing those relationships. And so um, it's just a different way of doing things. Again, not better or worse, just different. So culture will affect communication. We need to be sensitive to that. It's a shrinking world. We need to be aware of the fact that culture is going to affect communication and, uh, and be sensitive to that. Whatever questions you have about this uh, about this or any other material, feel free to shoot me an email. I'd be happy to discuss culture with you a little more. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Again, just shoot me an email. I'm very responsive to emails, so uh, don't hesitate to do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, until next time, happy communicating.